record something against the property and the legislature has acknowledged this, it has consequential damages. Uh, in fact, AB 817.535 provides for the, that a court can find that there's a minimum of $2,500 worth of damages. So even if there's still counsel in the underlying action, this is not something that can be fully addressed by that proceeding. If the court has no further questions, I'll reserve the remainder for the moment. Okay, you have about six minutes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Scott Davis. I'm with Business Law Group, and I'm representing Business Law Group here today. Um, may it please the Court? Um, the, um, the first point that counsel raised was a procedural matter involving whether the uh, absolute or whether the qualified privilege was argued or raised at the summary judgment hearing. Um, we do have a transcript, and I'm, I, sit, I saw on the record to the index that the notice of filing was in there, but I don't know if the actual transcript was filed. So, in any event, um, we argued uh, the Delmonico case, and in their rehearing motion, in the motion for rehearing, they raised the Delmonico case and, and argued, at best, it's a qualified privilege. So, I would, I would suggest that um, it, this is kind of a strange procedural history. What happened was we had a, an initial hearing back in January of 13, I believe. Um, when we got to the hearing room, the new trial judge was a, a close friend of mine from law school, and he ended up recusing himself. Um, but, we, but only after we argued the entire uh, argument. And, and during that argument, uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, Mr. Knight's um, uh, predecessor counsel, uh, raised the Delmonico case. And, um, and then later, in on the uh, March hearing that we had, we argued the Delmonico case. He raised the Delmonico case. And then they raised it again in our motion for rehearing. So I would respectfully suggest that even if we didn't expressly put that into our written uh, motion, um, it was, they, they, had, they had notice of it because they had three months between the January hearing and the March hearing prepared for that. They did argue it at the hearing, and they argued it in the rehearing motion. So I believe that that objection would be waived. Um, yeah, but if it, if it and this, if I, if I recall correctly, this order didn't really elaborate it one way or the other. The order itself, it, it wasn't, it wasn't that they grant the motion for some judgment and defend it and go hence without that. So for the most part, yes. I mean, it did go through an analysis of Florida jurisprudence on litigation privilege, but it didn't say this is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely unqualified. Because if you get into qualified, now aren't you talking about a, a you know, intent? And that's generally a jury question. We express malice right. is, is what has to be shown. And if we get into that, um, now the Delmonico case interestingly says that in litigation privilege, if it's even if it's not absolute and if it's qualified, and if you set forth in your you know, your defense that this was taken in connection with litigation, um, the burden then falls on the plaintiff to establish express malice. The express malice part. Yeah, yeah, but if you are moving for summary judgment, your burden is the whole whole shebang. You have to show that you cannot be held liable for this. So you don't shift the burden to the plaintiff on a summary judgment motion. Correct. It, what it really is is it's an avoidance. Um, so in other words, they see us for saying we're tied when we say litigation privilege, then as an avoidance, they should raise and say, no, it's it was expressed malice. And so if you're saying litigation privilege, absolute privilege, they don't, you know, I mean, if it's not made clear what it is you're looking for, they, they don't know that they have to, you know, come back and say no express malice. But if you're, if you're trying to get a summary judgment, if you're trying to defend a summary judgment on the basis of qualified immunity, then whatever they did or didn't do, if you didn't, you know, you, it's going to be your burden to show that you cannot be held liable. And you know, regardless of what would have happened in terms of a burden shift, you know, at a trial. Well, I agree that, that we have to we if we are moving on an affirmative defense, we have to establish all elements of that defense. And I believe we did that. There's an exception to that defense which is um, 
the express amounts. Now, counsel, the data on summary judgment, you can't then just sit back and say, well, now the judge, they have to come forward with evidence on the express amounts. Your burden on summary judgment is to completely eliminate their, their position. You know, or maybe relatedly, you have a set of circumstances, right, where uh, to take to take the facts in the light most favorable to AGM, you filed two claims of lien after there had been a consent judgment quieting title as to one lien on the same debt. Uh, at and after your firm had been discharged as counsel for the lien war, and then the fifth of those claims of lien was filed after a second judgment, admittedly, while an appeal was pending. Why couldn't uh, a jury reasonably infer express malice from those set of facts? And is there anything else in the record that would kind of have required a different way? Um, I'll take your last question first. There was nothing submitted in the record other than the filings of the liens um, to suggest to even raise a possible inference of, of express malice. And the, the new express malice means, as stated in the Delmonico case, is your primary motive has to be to harm the reputation of, of, of the plaintiff. Um, there, there was nothing filed to indicate, there were nothing, they, no depositions taken, no interrogatories, nothing to indicate that there was any intent on the part of business law group or that its primary intent was to harm uh, the reputation of, of the plaintiff. Um, and you filed two more claims of lien. What other conclusion can be drawn? Well, I'm representing anyone. You're filing two claims of lien after you're discharged. What is the objective of that? Well, this is this an issue of fact for the jury. This, this was argued at the, at the uh, summary judgment hearing, and um, the judge said, well, can, you know, what's this? Can you explain this? And I said, well, yes, we were through because we were sued in the same action as the association, and there, was a, I didn't, there wasn't an actual conflict at the time, but there was a potential conflict, and there was a potential that, that our lawyers would have to testify as witnesses, which would be prohibited by the bar rule. And so we were through, and probably should have been clear in our motion, as trial counsel, but we continue to represent Glendale in many other units. Is any of this in the record? Um, the order of the motion of order of withdrawal of my direction. And but, I mean, I, I, yes. I guess let me let me ask the question very precisely because I think it's important. Is there anything in the record that explains why your firm withdrew and whether it had any continuing role on behalf of the association subsequent to the withdrawal? Yes, there is. Um, this, again, this case has a lot of kind of complexities and nuances, but the association was under a funding contract with a company called Allen Funding, which you may have seen in the, in the papers. Um, AGM filed as part of its amended third party complaint a copy of that um, contract. That contract contains a power of attorney by which the association grants to Allen Funding and indirectly to BLG the right to go out and do everything necessary or appropriate to collect on these um, delinquent accounts. And that contract says that that will continue on until the full balance is collected or I guess if you lose the case then it's over and then the unit returns to the association. So and the power of attorney is in paragraph four. Uh, that is, is an exhibit, I think the first exhibit to the, um, to the amended third party complaint. And it, it spells out specifically certain things that can be done, such as filing liens, sending demand letters, et cetera. And then the last one says anything necessary to pursue collection of the delinquent account. And it says that Ellen Funding is authorized to hire BLG, and it gives Ellen Funding a power of attorney, and it says BLG will act as uh, attorney in fact for the association. So um, and the trial court said, you know, why did you would yeah, I explain that to him? This is in the trial transcript. And, and we just, and I said, Your Honor, you probably have come across situations where a client will be represented by a trial counsel, and then other counsel, maybe a general counsel or whatever, that does other matters. We continue on in our representation doing things that would not require us to be in the courtroom at the trial and testify. Um, so, with regard to the attorney client relationships continuation, the power of attorney spells out that that continues until the end of the case. 
and that is in, in the record. So, um, so I think that although the order simply says, you know, you're withdrawn from, you're discharged from the case, we, we weren't terminated by the client, we just withdrew because of the potentials that emerged. Um, we were still representing them. We look at the that for, for the moment, just for the sake of discussion, that the record was silent for what happened. What we had was a withdrawal, or, or assume that it was just a bona fide withdrawal that, that ter terminated the attorney client relationship for all purposes. In your view, with the filing of a claim of lien uh, subsequent to with that withdrawal, be entitled to absolute litigation privilege, and if so, fine. I believe so because in this case, the the proceeding was still in place, and if there was a question of fact as to whether the attorney who says he's representing this party actually does or does not, um, that's a that is really an issue between that client and the attorney. And the lien could have been filed on, as a transactional matter. Exactly. I mean, it, 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 it's not but, but the privilege requires a connection to litigation, right? And, yes, sir. And if the defendant no longer has authority to act for the lien or, how could the defendant's act of filing the lien have any connection to litigation when the defendant has no business acting on behalf of the lien or in the first place? Well, I think. I mean, it's a good point, and I, and I take your point, but I think it goes back to the, what is the purpose of the litigation privilege. It is to prevent collateral litigation against counsel, which, I mean, if we open it, if we narrow it even further, then, you know, the consequences could be lawyers suing other lawyers all the time. And if there's a wrongful act taken, if there's an ultra various act, if you will, where the law firm, it could even be a mistake, the law firm thought they were still representing or whatever. Um, Maybe the client sent a termination letter you didn't get. The litigation privilege doesn't justify a lawyer, right? I'm sorry? The litigation privilege doesn't just protect lawyers. Correct. It protects everything. Participants in the litigation. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not to cast aspersions on your situation, as I, you know, you, it makes sense the way you explain it. But um, it does, though, point to, you know, like some problematic aspects of, like, an absolute privilege in, it, in these circumstances. And, and as I can tell you as judges, we hear from like, sovereign citizens all the time. And we've probably got some liens on our property, you know, and we claim the liens on our property, as we sit here. And, and, you know, and I, I don't mean to make it personal for us, but I mean, that happens. And, and, and so the suggestion would be, though, is that is, is we couldn't then go sue them for any damage they cause by filing that claim of lien. Well, I think it depends on the context. I mean, if there's if there's well, a violation, statute, that's right. But it talks about that. That's a that's a separate cause of that. You would have that, but you also have other um, remedies, as uh, Judge C mentioned earlier. You got a fifty-seven. If they file, they file a lawsuit. Right. A lot of times they file these claims, and then there's never going to end up on the lawsuit, but you got to see it. Well, I mean, we also have the remedy of filing a deck, deck action. I stand to that extent. extent. Mm -hmm. There's a damage. That's a damage from a slander of title, right? The expense you go through to remove it. I suppose so. It is. That's what I can tell you. It is. Yeah. It's a matter of law. So, you know, but you would, you know, what you're saying, you could never recover that. Well, I think you could because you would have to go to some court that has jurisdiction over the sovereign citizen. But well, I mean, it could be a practical effect. Is I think a lot of the sovereign citizens aren't too pecuniary, but uh, yeah, in fact, we also have some of them. You'd be surprised, but um, um, if you this is a larger issue, and somebody has a beat, somebody, you know, somebody just. You know, as I say, has a need to get somebody else. It doesn't have to be a sovereign citizen, but just kind of misguided, you know, self represented. Goes and follows claim. There's no remedy for that damage. Other than for you to file a lawsuit. Other than for you to file a lawsuit. Well, what I'm saying is, is that, that the claim of lien is not. It can be, it, it usually is, a, it's a requirement of, uh, to, to, to find the lawsuit, but it's not always connected to a lawsuit. And then, even if you determine that the lawsuit is frivolous, is it really, even if the lawsuit is frivolous and you get damages or you get whatever sanctions you get, 
it, does the claim of lien it, it necessarily is that necessarily included in it? if it's privileged automatically? Well, I think that what happened in that context is if the court found the underlying claim to be frivolous, they would enter a 57105 and they would also strike the claim of lien. Well, they, yeah, they would, but what, you know, the thing is, is that you've been damaged. 57105 doesn't give you consequential damage. Um, no. Actually, you know, there, I, I had, there's an argument that other people have made that it, that it doesn't, and it's been raised, and there's one case out there that talks about potential for that. But so what we do get, for instance, if you filed a frivolous lawsuit, and what would otherwise be actionable slanders were made in the lawsuit, would you then have an exception to the litigation privilege to sue for damages for the slander? I don't believe so, Your Honor. I believe so. So if the, if the claim of lien is closed with his absolute privilege, even if it's in support of an absolutely frivolous claim, even if they file a suit, even if you get the 7105, you're never going to be able to get consequential damages for the slam, correct? If, if it's absolutely privileged. Well, I believe that the, the trial court um, could actually award those damages as sanctions. Um, I mean, as, as part of the attorney's fees that you incur, which is what we have to do with that. Well, that would be the court's prerogative, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, so you don't have a cause of action, because the Constitution guarantees you the right to your trial if you want on your cause of action. Correct, except if the litigation privilege is applicable, and, and the reason is in the case of we're balancing two competing public interests. One is you know, full and open and not to handle the litigants, and, and the other is to protect people from being unfairly said. And the court came down and said, we're going to side essentially with, with, and they say, whatever happens in the course of a judicial proceeding, as long as it is connected in some way to the proceeding, is absolutely privileged. Now, you've got remedies such as you can file, um, I mean, they can file a lawsuit against your client, they can do a counterclaim against your client, they can do 57105. In this case, as, as the court pointed out, they could have filed a 57105 motion during the because all of these claims were filed during the active life of the case. And they could have filed a 57105 after the fourth claim of lien. They could have filed a 57105 after the fifth claim of lien. Excuse me. They could have gone back after, if there had been no appeal, they could have gone back and said, Judge, we need you to enforce the judgment because they still had this, they had to discharge these liens. And the court could have entered an order discharging the liens. So there were other, many other remedies that would have been um, available that would have avoided this type of collateral litigation and, and you know, extended litigation, quite frankly. And um, so, and then the point of the last two points of lien, um, counsel said, well, we were damaged because we couldn't use the property to get refinanced. But there have been a Liz Pendens on this property since 2011. It, there were prior liens on it already. Um, so the fact that these other these last two liens were filed, I'm going to get hung up on this, but why would 57105 reach uh, an act that precedes the filing of a complaint invoking the judicial process? In other words, it, just the, the mere filing of a defamatory claim of lien, why would that be reachable by 57105 and subsequent litigation related to the claim? Well, because if, if I'm assuming, if I'm arguing with this file, if it says it's an improper claim of lien, then, then I file my foreclosure case. If I continue to assert the validity of that lien, and it's truly frivolous, then you can assume, then you would get your 57105. So even though it took place prior to the actual lawsuit, the act of me filing the complaint and continuing to litigate it. Right, but the act that, that 57105 prescribes would be the maintenance uh, in court of the baseless claim uh, of indebtedness, not the act, not the pre-litigation act of filing lien. Do you follow me? Yes, yes. I mean, oh, so, and so in order to like say if there was a safe harbor, right, letter, would, in order to get the advantage of that, it would also involve withdrawing the claim of lien as opposed to just dismissing the lawsuit. Uh, yeah, I think so, yes. 57105 may give you some remedy to some aspect, but it's just not, definitely not, a complete remedy. For, if no other reason, then you can't get a jury trial on your consequence. 
So, so in, in at least in that respect, it is not a complete record for what uh, that you would otherwise have for uh, uh, for a slander over time. I, I think I'd agree with that. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, but his better argument is, is in the balancing, in the balancing of the interest, it would be enough. I think that's where the Supreme Court has come out. They said there will be instances where you won't have a full remedy, right. um, but that's you know the price that they pay, and that's what they, they came down on. Um, um, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, you've got about 30 seconds. Okay, okay. so we let you use your time, so I, uh, I'll go. Okay, I think I appreciate this. that. One thing I wanted to bring up that's really important is they've only appeared on the fourth and fifth rounds. All the other stuff that was, we allegedly did improperly wasn't sued on. Um, two of the defendants in this case, um, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Casanova, attorneys at our firm, were sued initially, and all of their involvement was related to everything prior to the fourth and fifth claims of lien. So I would I would suggest that whatever decision your honors come up with, they're out. They should be out. And if there's no further questions, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wright. May it please the court. I'd like to address the last point first, I guess, in our latency uh, regarding Mr. Rogers and Mr. Casanova. Um, there's nothing in the record that says that they were not a part of the filing of the fourth and fifth claim of lien. There's no affidavit from them saying that they filed absolutely zero evidence in support of their motion for summary judgment. So there's no competent evidence by which the trial court could make such a finding. And certainly no competent evidence in the record by which this court could, could support it and argue in favor of that court's ruling. Um, I share the concerns that you have, Judge Weintraub. 57105 is not an appropriate remedy here. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not complete, obviously. Uh, I mean, names what may not be a remedy at all for the claim of being standing by itself. Well, what do you say to the suggestion that, that this is a balancing? You know, because just to get absolute immunity or any kind of immunity, any sort of act necessarily takes away uh, someone else's right. And so, so you know, so the Supreme Court has balanced those things out and said, you know, for the for the for the sake of free and open litigation or what have you, we, we're going to we'll take away that right. In, in this case, the balancing would occur on remand related to a qualified privilege analysis. Okay. That's the safeguard against unwarranted litigation against parties and counsel. Yeah. In this case, the question before the court is, does absolute privilege apply to these claims of lien? Can you speak to our, can, can you please speak to the argument that the record contains an explanation of the withdrawal of counsel and, and, and indicates that there was a continuing representation with respect to the filing of claims of lien subject to BLG's discharge from the litigation? Yes. After the statement, I, I suppose that he knew the association. The association filed an affidavit in support of the motion for reconsideration filed by it. That's in the record, volume 6, page 1124. Paragraph 10 of that affidavit specifically states, by the association vice president, we had no knowledge that this so they're was their disavowal. They're disavowing. Exactly. The association itself has disavowed the representation. And I think if anybody could control the scope of representation, it would be the client in this case. Um, so at the time that the liens were filed, despite the contract that's alleged between LM funding and business law group, which is in our, our mindset, a wrongful usurpation of the power of the association, I'm not even sure that the association can give that kind of power of attorney to a third party entity. Well, so I think if the, if the case turned on that, at least then there would be a fact dispute, at least. Yes, there would be a fact dispute. And, and, and also, I disagree with the assertion that there's nothing in the record as to the existence or lack thereof regarding express balance. Our verified complaint is verified in affidavit form, not on information and belief. And Anthony Marcello, the principal for AGM Investors, filed a separate affidavit as well. There is evidence from our side on the record. The, the thing is, there's no evidence from their side, which is why I led with the point that Rogers and Casanova uh, remain a part of this because there's nothing filed by them indicating that they were not involved with the filing of the court and this claim to claim. That would be a prerequisite to letting them out on that issue. 
Um, if we're looking at ultra vires acts, and, and, and it was mentioned that you could file a counterclaim, if, if a lien is filed and a wrongful action then filed afterwards, uh, that a counterclaim against the potential client would be sufficient. In this case, first of all, if, if absolute privilege applies, that counterclaim is not going to survive. But even then, if the client, like in this case, didn't authorize the filing of the lien, that is an inappropriate remedy because the party who actually caused the harm is not the one who gets the consequences from it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, unless the court has any further questions, I conclude my argument. Okay. Thank you both very much. Well argued.